So welcome to this video on uh, operators. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about specific types of operators, but we'll start off with a recap on uh, some of the Hilbert spaces that we've talked about. So let me remind you, an element of a, vec of a Hilbert space H will be denoted by this, um, this cat notation. This is the element phi. Um, and the element of a dual space phi star will be denoted by the bra notation. So this element chi is part of the dual space H star. Uh, between an element of a dual space and the element of the Hilbert space itself, there's a, a scalar or inner product defined. So phi and chi in this bracket notation is a complex number. Um, and we define linear operators on states um, in the, the Hilbert space, or of course, um, through the adjoint notation in, uh, on, the, um, on the dual space uh, H star. We can represent both states phi um, or operators A in a basis for the Hilbert space. So in this case, phi can be decomposed into its coefficient C sub i for all of the um, elements, for all of the basis states uh, i. And then if we apply a linear operator A on that state phi, we get a different decomposition in terms of coefficients d. The connection between d and the coefficient c for the original state is given by the matrix representation of the operator A. We talked about two special types of operators. First of all, Hermitian operators that have real eigenvalues and orthogonal eigenvectors, um, or in the case of uh, degenerate eigenvalues, uh, we can come up with a set of orthogonal eigenvectors. And then unitary operators, which describe orthonormal basis transformations or describe how the coefficients of states and how um, the matrix representation of, um, of, of operators, how that changes under a, a basis transformation from one orth orthonormal to another orthonormal basis. So we'll see both of those come back fairly soon again. So um, let's define now the outer product. So in, uh, in comparison with the inner product, which reduces the uh, two elements which are, which are um, combined in the inner product to a, a result that is uh, in the, the complex numbers, um, the outer product takes uh, two elements, one from the Hilbert space and one from the uh, dual space, and combines them into an operator. So if we look at this combination, um, cat alpha uh, multiplied with uh, this complex number, which is the inner product of beta and gamma, um, that is a state in the vector space multiplied by a complex number. Now we can look at this differently as well. We can look at this as a operator that consists of the cat alpha and the bra beta multiplied with an element uh, or operating on an element of the Hilbert space gamma. So we can think of the um, alpha beta combination that we have here as a as an operator and that is what we use as a definition of the the outer product so that's the outer product of alpha and beta which is um, cat alpha bra beta um, in terms of matrix representations you can think of uh, in the first case if we look at the scalar product um, that is a uh, um, a Hermitian conjugate of a vector multiplied with its vector. So that's kind of the, the traditional description of, a, of a, a scalar product between vectors. Um, and that gives us a single number. If we do something similar, so we, we swap the orientations, and now we multiply a column vector with a row vector, then we end up with a um, n times n matrix, um, which is again, which is the matrix representation by its definition. Um, of uh, a linear operator on uh, complex numbers, on the complex vectors in, uh, in, in uh, Cn. So all of this kind of makes sense, this, uh, this comparison between um, the matrix representation in a certain basis and then um, the, uh, the actual objects and the outer product and inner product relationships. So what are the properties of the outer product? Well, similar to the inner product, if we take the adjoint of this outer product, which is, again, this is a, an operator. The outer product returns an operator. So when we um, take the adjoint that is an, a relationship relationship between operators, it's not a relationship between uh, matrices or, or, or vectors. Um, so if we take 
the outer product, the eye joint of the outer product, then we um, we get the same thing as if we were to um, swap the roles of uh, alpha and beta. Beta, we basically we would change beta to its um, dual space and alpha to its dual space and have the operator between those two um, objects. Okay, so let's move on now to a specific type of operators, namely projection operators, which um, are formed through this outer product. So let's first look at this in a more abstract way. Um, we'll consider our main vector space or Hilbert space um, H and consider how it can be split up into two orthogonal subspaces. So we ha will have a, a, a subspace H sub one and a subspace H sub two, such that for all elements of H one and for all elements of H two, they are orthogonal to each other. So um, in the case of a, a two dimensional analog, uh, we have a, a full vector space that is the full comp uh, the full two-dimensional plane. One subspace could be all of the vectors that are along the x-axis. Uh, another subspace, an orthogonal or the orthogonal subspace to that first subspace is the subspace um, that is uh, denoted by the, the y-axis, all vectors that are along the y-axis. So for any vector along the x-axis, that will be perpendicular or orthogonal to any vector along the y-axis. We cannot write any state phi in our Hilbert space or any vector in the two-dimensional plane as the sum of two components, the first component in the first vector space, the second vector subspace, and the second component in the second vector subspace, where naturally phi 1 and phi 2 are going to be orthogonal. So that basically means we're decomposing our two-dimensional vector into an x component and a y component, but we can do that more generally on any kind of um, Hilbert space that has these two orthogonal subspaces. Now we define a projection operator, P sub 1, that is the operator that projects from our full Hilbert space onto the first subspace. So um, in, in the case of our two-dimensional analog, we would have a projection operator P sub x that projects the state phi onto phi x. In this case, P sub 1 on phi projects phi onto phi 1, which is the the component of phi in uh, subspace H1. This uh, projection operator has a number of properties. First of all, it's linear. So if we apply this on a, a linear combination of states, we'll get the linear combination of the projected states. Um, it's Hermitian. Uh, we can actually prove that. You just apply it. Um, first apply P sub 1, sub one um, on, uh, on this scalar product um, and then apply P sub um, 1 adjoint, so that then applies on chi. And because um, in the first case, for example, we have chi with a scalar product on phi 1, we know that chi, if we split this up into chi 1 plus chi 2, chi 2 is in subspace H2, while phi sub 1 is in subspace 1, and all of those um, states in subspace 1 and subspace 2 are perpendicular to each other. So using linearity, we can then um, find that the, the same um, the same scalar product between the components only in subspace one. So that shows in that uh, um, the projection operator is Hermitian. Um, it's also um, the, the square of the operator of the projection operator is equal to the operator itself um, because if we apply a projection operator onto a subspace on an element of that subspace then we'll just get the same element back and so uh, multi applying the same projection operator multiple times doesn't uh, doesn't bring you anything extra we can actually do this the other way around as well every operator um, p sub 1 for which this relationship is satisfied so um, if you combine if you look at this this is a combination of this item potency um, property that p sub i squared is equal to p sub i and the fact that it's Hermitian so that one of those p sub 1's uh, can be uh, turned in, into its adjoint. Um, so we can go through the proof um, here. So first of all we can look at um, p sub 1 adjoint and then use this expression to show that p sub 1 adjoint is equal to p sub 1. So any operator for which this is satisfied is going to be automatically Hermitian, which is one of the properties of a projection operator. So excellent. Um, also, uh, p sub 1 on phi is going to be in the vector subspace of, uh, of, Hil of this Hilbert space. So we can show that that is a, a vector um, that, that forms that those 
um, elements form a vector subspace on their own, right? So then what we do is we write or phi one as um, the, the part that is uh, given by the output of the projection operator or by the operator piece of one, which we're trying to show as a projection operator, and then the remaining um, part, which is defined here as phi two. Now what we'll show is that phi two as defined by this remaining part of phi, um, that this is orthogonal to all of the possible um, results from a projection operator on any state chi from the original Hilbert space. So if we, um, if we just apply that, uh, if we, we calculate the inner product, we'll have two components here. Um, so we'll have the two components that came from our phi two here, multiply our um, in inner product with the projection on subspace one of chi. Um, and then we can use our um, p sub one minus p sub one squared, which is basically our, our definition along with the fact that it's Hermitian um, to show that this will always be, be equal to zero. So what we've shown is that uh, um, this operator for which this is satisfied, this is indeed a projection operator um, in, in any case. Projection operators have eigenvalues that are equal to zero or equal to one. Um, the trace of the projection operator will be the dimension of the subspace. Um, you can do that by writing, you can show that by writing the projection operator in a diagonal basis um, and uh, using the, the uh, expressions of the um, basis vectors or in this diagonal basis, the projection operator will be diagonal. So the trace will just be the sum of its um, of its elements on the diagonal, which will be the eigenvalues in which are equal to zero or one. So that gives you then the different, the dimension of the subspace. So in the case of um, two dimensional vectors, uh, we have our projection operator on X and on Y, where that's of course immediately visible. So we get our one zero and our zero one, both of which um, give us then a trace that's equal to one or a projection operator that projects on a subspace of dimension one. Um, now, if we project onto a subspace that has a, a more extended basis, so not just one dimensional basis X and Y, as in the case of the two dimensional plane here. Um, so let's say that we project on a, on a subspace H sub one, um, which has a basis, uh, which has these M basis vectors. So the dimension of the subspace is equal to M, the dimension of the full Hilbert space is equal to capital N. So then the projection operator will be given by the sum of those projection operators on each of the individual basis vectors. So that will project on our, our, Hilbert, um, our Hilbert subspace. The full um, set of uh, projection operators on all of the individual basis vectors added together, um, that will give us the identity. And so uh, that's what's going to give us our completeness relationship. So basically we project a state this operator projects a state onto the Hilbert space itself, so that doesn't really make any difference, right? Now, um, what can we use this completeness relation for? for um, well, let's look, for example, at uh, the matrix representation of the product of these two, uh, or of the, the, the product of these two linear operators. So um, that's defined as the matrix element of uh, AB. Um, and uh, if we insert between A and B here, this completeness relation, basically the identity. So we have A times the identity times B. We can expand that using this uh, projection operator. So we'll um, have the product of these two matrix elements. So what we show then is that, or what we see then is that um, the matrix element or the matrix representation of, of A, B is indeed the product of the matrix representations of A and B individually. Okay. So now let's look at uh, projection operators of a very specific subspace, and that is the subspace spanned by eigenvectors of uh, Hermitian operators. So we've shown previously that uh, eigenvalues of Hermitian operators are real, um, and that the eigenvectors can be used to construct an orthonormal basis. So if we have uh, all different eigenvalues, then all of the eigenvectors are already orthogonal to each other, and we can just normalize them. Um, if we have uh, degeneracy in the eigenvalues, then we will need to apply Gram-Schmidt to, uh, to orthonormalize these, uh, these um, spaces given by um, the eigenvectors corresponding to the degenerate eigenvalues. So each eigenvalue corresponds to a subspace of dimension Gn, uh, and Gn is the multiplicity of the eigenvectors. So in the case of 
all different eigenvalues, gn will be equal to one for all n, and n will be equal to the dimension of, uh, of the space that we're looking at. Uh, in the case of degenerate eigenvalues, gn will be um, non -e not equal to one for some of the values of n or for some of the eigenvalues. And so what we can do is uh, we can um, look at our complete, uh, we can rewrite our um, expression for, um, or we can, we can compose projection operators rather that um, project on the subspace um, that corresponds with each eigenvalue. So if we have our eigenvalues a1 through a n, um, we'll have projection operators p1 through p n that are given by um, the sum of all of the eigenvalue uh, eigenvectors in an outer product with themselves um, in that subspace, or in other words, all of the eigenvectors corresponding with um, that eigenvalue. So in the case of uh, um, an eigenvalue with a multiplicity equal to one, um, we'd end up summing over both of the um, eigenvectors in uh, corresponding with that, eigen, um, with that eigenvalue. So now the completeness relation um, becomes the sum of all of those projection operators for all of the eigenvalues. Um, and so we can again say that uh, the sum of the um, the uh, projection operators for all of the eigenvalues will be equal to the identity. So this again will be a useful um, a useful identity relation to uh, to insert in calculations. Um, so let me just point out the difference though that um, in the, the previous relationship here we're looking at um, projection operators for any basis. Um, so what we've done here, we, we've just picked a particular basis, and so we have to do the counting a little bit differently to take into account the fact that eigenvalues can be degenerate um, for these Hermitian operators. So where can we use this, for example? Um, we can use this uh, for a, a, a spectral decomposition of, of a Hermitian operator in these projection operators. Um, so if we have a um, operator operating on a state, we can insert this uh, full sum, this completeness relation between A and the state phi. Uh, and so now, of course, A is operating on uh, a state that's projected on um, the subspace corresponding with uh, an eigenvalue. So we can apply this eigenvalue relationship. So we have the sum over all eigenvalues multiplied respectively with the projection operator on this state. So this is, of course, applied on one state, um, but we can turn that back into an operator relationship. So the operator will be equal to the sum over all um, eigenvectors, where we have an outer product of, an eigen, of the eigenvector multiplied with the eigenvalue itself and then the eigenvector again. So that's a way to, uh, to write any Hermitian operator into um, a, a sum of projection operators multiplied with the eigenvalue for that particular subspace. Now, finally, let's look at uh, two commuting Hermitian operators. So let's uh, consider the Hermitian operators A and B. Um, they're said to commute when uh, the commutator of A and B or AB minus BA is equal to zero. Uh, so um, this is, of course, not something that is, uh, that is normally or, or that is expected to be satisfied for all operators. So it takes special operators for, for this to be satisfied. Now, if we have two Hermitian operators that commute in this way, then we can construct a basis of, um, of the Hil Hilbert space from the eigenvectors that are common, or, or a basis that is common to A um, and B. So um, we can uh, construct um, this, you know, let's assume, let, let's write um, our eigenvalues of A as A sub N and the eigenvectors again with N um, and, and uh, an index I that can uh, um, enumerate the, the degenerate eigenvectors or the, the eigenvectors corresponding with the degenerate eigenvalues of A. So now we can look at B A um, on this, uh, this eigenvector. So by uh, assumption of, uh, or by definition of, of the, the fact that A and B commute, this, e this is equal to A times B um, operating on the eigenvector. And then um, if we go back to the first expression, we can also just apply A on the eigen eigenvector and uh, substitute that with, for the, the eigenvalue. So what we see is that um, A on B 
on the eigenvector is equal to a, a sub n on b times eigenvector. So b on the eigenvector must be in the subspace of the eigenvalue a sub n of a. Now there's two possibilities, either um, the multiplicity of that eigenvalue is equal to one. If that multiplicity is equal to one, then b operating on that eigenvector must be um, must be proportional to the eigenvector itself. And of course, if b operating on the eigenvector is proportional to the eigenvector, that means that, that this eigenvector is also an eigenvector of b, um, and there must be an eigenvalue that is the proportionality constant between those two um, expressions. So, okay, in that case, um, we've shown that uh, um, these eigenvectors are, are common between um, a and b. Now, the other option is that uh, um, the multiplicity is of course larger than one however then b can be written as a block diagonal in block diagonal form in the basis given by all of the eigenvectors um, of a and each block can now be diagonalized, diagonalized independently without actually affecting any diagonalization of a because a is already diagonal um, in that block as it's a, a degenerate set of um, or, or the eigenvalues for which those blocks are non-diagonal they are um, uh, they, they're degenerate uh, for a so we can choose whatever eigenvector we want and that's how we can uh, we can use that liberty to choose um, a uh, set of eigenvectors um, that is uh, that results in b being uh, um, block diagonal so again that will give us a set of eigenvectors um, for that is uh, shared between b and a now that uh, ultimately allows us to write something like this where uh, our operator a on our eigenvector state um, gives us an eigenvalue a sub n um, our operator b on this eigenstate gives us um, gives us an eigenvalue b sub p and so n and p are the shared labels um, between uh, for the eigenvec eigenvalues between a and b and of course when we, once we have this uh, we can show um, in the other direction that if we now apply the, um, the, the commutator on this state then uh, because this return this uh, reverts into a, a numeric relationship between a sub n and b, p, b sub p that this is of course satisfied and will, will always be equal to zero okay <coughs> excuse me now the only other thing I want to introduce here is that a, uh, a now a set of mutually commuting Hermitian operators so a set of A and B and possibly C and D and, and multiple Hermitian operators that are all mutually commuting with each other so A sub 1 and A sub, uh, sub 2 have a commutator that's equal to 0 A sub 1 and A sub 3 have a, a commutator that's equal to 0 and so on so this set of mutually commuting Hermitian operators such that the eigenvalues alone specify a unique set of basis factors so we don't need any there's no um, indeterminacy there's no um, degeneracy if you want to call it between uh, different labels of eigenvectors that um, that you know that leads to this uh, that leads to a, a non-unique um, set of eigenvectors a set of, of basis states um, this uh, if if there is um, if the eigenvalues alone for this set of uh, mutually commuting operators if they specify a unique set um, of, of basis factors then this is a complete set of compatible operators so we already know this, this the compatible operators are the ones where the commutator um, is equal to zero uh, now this is a complete set because um, it uh, can be used to specify this basis uh, factors based on the eigenvalues alone. So there's no indeterminacy left. So we'll come back to that in the next video where we'll talk about um, the, the postulates of quantum mechanics.